The first algorithm we're going to talk about is the depth first search. Now the depth first search and the breadth first search are both similar in a lot of ways, but we're just going to go over one of them first. And then as we go to the breadth first search, you'll see how the two sort of relate to each other and how they're similar. So in general, a DFS and a BFS, which are short for depth first search and breadth first search, uh, can be used to answer questions like, can I get from node A to node B in our graph? So if you're looking at this here graph, you might ask, can I get from the eight to the seven? Now in a fully connected graph, like most trees, all the nodes are connected. So what this means is that you don't really have to say, can I get from the eight to the seven? Instead, you can kind of just say, you know, is the seven in our graph? because you know you're always going to start from the root and it's always connected to everything. But it's important to show the difference that if this line didn't exist, we can't just say, does 12 exist in our graph? Because if we start at the eight, we won't ever hit the 12, but it does exist in our entire graph. So that's a very important difference that if you have a fully connected graph where all these things are connected to each other, you can just say, does it exist in our graph? And trees generally tend to be fully connected. I've never really seen a useful tree that's not, so, you know, moving forward, we're going to assume that our trees are completely connected. But when we start to look at graphs that aren't always that, you have to remember that, you know, sometimes that's something you have to remember. So we're going to go ahead with the example, does seven exist in our graph? So we're going to always start at this root node of eight, and we're going to basically look for seven inside of our graph. Now this graph happens to be sorted, but we're gonna pretend like we don't know that. We're just gonna pretend like we're just doing a search in our graph and we don't really know how the data is organized. So a DFS is called a depth first search because it goes as deep as possible and then it backtracks and continues to go as deep as possible every time it can. That's you know why it gets the term depth first search. So I'm just gonna sort of walk you through how this might go about with a, you know, with a search. We always start at our root node, so that's our eight here. And while we're there, we're going to basically, um, in this case, we're always gonna go left as soon as we can. And if we can't go left any farther, we're gonna backtrack and then we're gonna to try to go right as far as we can. Or sorry, I take that back. We're always gonna go left as far as we can. And then if we can't go left, we're gonna go right. And if we can't go right, we're gonna backtrack. So starting at the eight, we're going to go left. So left would take us to this four here. So once we get to the four, uh, we're gonna, we will check along the way to see if we found the seven we're looking for. And four is not seven, so again, we're gonna go left. So we find a two here, and we realize that two is not the number we're looking for, so again, we're gonna go left. So at this point, we get to the one, it's not the number we're looking for, and we try to go left, but there's nowhere to go to the left. We don't really have a left child. So instead of going left, we then go to the next step and we look at our right child. So one doesn't have a right child either, so at this point, it's tried to go left, it's tried to go right, so now we're gonna backtrack up to the two. So once we backtrack, the two is gonna continue from wherever it left off. So the last thing the two did was it tried to go left and it went to the one. So at this point, it's, it's gonna know that it can't go left anymore and it's gonna try to go right. So we get down to the three and we do the exact same thing we were talking about before, where we try to go left, there are no children. We try to go right, there are no children. So then we're gonna backtrack. So this time we're gonna backtrack to the two, and then the two is not gonna have any word, you know, it's not gonna have a left or right to go to because we've already been to both. So the two will backtrack to the four. Finally, when we get to the four, the four is going to backtrack, or sorry, the four is going to know that we already searched the left-hand side, so it's now going to go to the right side. So that's how it got to the six here, is we backtracked all the way to the four, and then we went down to the six. So once we're at the six, uh, we continue with our normal flow. We, we go left first, we get to the five, and when we're at the five, we try to go left, we try to go right, we can't do either, so then we're gonna backtrack back up to the six. And then once we get back to the six, we're gonna, now we're gonna go down the right path. So we go down this right path here, and you notice that this is the number we're looking for. This is our seven, so we have successfully found seven using a DFS. So the big thing to remember is that when you're running the DFS, you always go left first, and then if you, once you're done going left as much as you can, you then go right. And then if, you, if you're if you done going all the right directions you can, you backtrack. So the way you would sort of find out if seven doesn't exist in this graph is if you ever got to the very root node, the eight, and it backtracks and there's nothing else to do, that would mean that at that point, we have not found what we were looking for and it's not in our graph. 
But when you're at the four, for example, you could go the entire way down the left, the entire way down the right, and say we were looking for the number nine um, over here. At this point, we would backtrack to the eight, and then from the eight, we would have to go down this right-hand side path. And we'd have to look at all these nodes before we could actually say that nine doesn't exist in our graph. So that's how the DFS works. You're always going as deep as possible down a path, backtracking as little as you can, and then going down another deep route. And you keep doing this until you find what you're looking for, or you've looked at the entire graph. So I'm just going to quickly walk through this with you one last time. I just want to show you, um, you know, basically what all nodes we'd look at along the way um, if we were searching for something that does not exist in our graph. So let's say we're searching for the number 16 and it doesn't exist. So the first thing we do is look at this 8. Then we'd go left to the 4, left to the 2, left to the 1. So there's no children to go to, so we backtrack back up to the 2. So now we're going to go down to the right-hand side, so we go to the 3. Again, there's no children, so we backtrack up to the two. There's no right or left path to go down anymore, so we go back up to the four. And at this point, we're gonna go down the right side. So we go to the six, the five, backtrack up to the six, down to the seven, backtrack to the six, backtrack to the four, backtrack to the eight. Now we can go down the right-hand side, so we go 12, and now we're going down the left-hand side. So we go 10, nine, we haven't found the 16 we're looking for, so we backtrack, we get on the right side. We get to 11, not the 16 we're looking for, so we backtrack to the 10, backtrack to the 12, now we go down to the 14, and then we go to the 13, we don't find what we're looking for, so we backtrack to the 14, go down the right-hand side, don't find what we're looking for. So at this point, we backtrack to the 14, backtrack to the 12, backtrack to the 8, and at this point when we're at the 8, there's nowhere else to go, so we backtrack, but there's nowhere to backtrack to either because we're at the root node. So that's how we know that 16 does not exist in this graph. If you're enjoying this series, I'd really appreciate it if you could head over to my blog at calhoun.io and head down to the mailing list and sign up. So I won't spam you or do anything like that. Uh, when you sign up for the mailing list, I will send you a free sample from my book, Web Development with Go. And then I'll send you an email about once a week, just letting you know about new articles or new videos or really any new free content that I'm sending or that I'm releasing, publishing. And I'll also let you know about, you know, what I'm working on in the coming weeks and try to get some feedback on what everybody thinks I should you know, focus on and what they'd like to hear me talk about. And every once in a while when I release a new product, a new course or a new book or something like that, I will send an email out to the mailing list. Oftentimes it'll be accompanied with a free sample or a discount code or something like that basically just letting you know about it. And if you like the stuff that I'm writing, chances are you'll you know, at least appreciate some of that. And I definitely really appreciate any of the purchases because they help support me and help me a lot to keep creating free material like this. Thanks so much.